OK, so yeah, I think that sounds good. All right, so let's just sort of recap where we are. Um, so what we have here is a picture of an MRI scanner. And the main parts are we have uh, this big magnet here. So this is a picture of a magnet being lifted on a crane, being put into our center. Um, so that the purpose of that magnet is um, to create polarization. So essentially, if you think about in equilibrium, all the spins are pointing in different directions. Uh, once we apply a main field, the knot field, then there's a tendency for them to align. Now, the tendency, most of the spins is a very weak tendency, and so that's why we're always trying to get bigger and bigger fields. But overall, there is this net uh, polarization there that you can see. Okay. Um, and so you can imagine what we have is we have some M naught to work with. Okay, so that's the magnetization that we create in the body. So when we put a subject in the scanner, uh, as a subject's going to the scanner, it creates this polarization aligned with the main magnetic field. The next step in the process is we use what's called the radio frequency coil. And we'll talk about this process in a, in a future lecture. But for now, uh, it suffices to say that we apply the RF pulse here, and the job of the RF pulse is to tip this magnetization away from its equilibrium state. Okay? And so this tipping that we do is called the flip angle. All right? And so theta of 45 degrees would mean we would tip it 45 degrees away. Uh, 90 degrees means we tip it 90 degrees away. And so we have a lot of flexibility. We'll find out how we do that tipping in a later lecture. Uh, but let's assume just for now, we tip the magnetization 90 degrees so that it's spinning completely in what we call the transverse plane. So just to remind you, by definition, Z is the direction of the main magnetic field. And that is what we call the longitudinal component. And then we have X and Y. Um, and these are the, uh, the transverse plane. OK? So then once it's in the sort of the transverse plane, we can sort of just, we're going to just think about what's happening in the transverse plane. So we imagine we have x, the magnetization in this xy plane, OK? Uh, just, by def just for, to keep things simple, we'll assume we've tipped it onto the x-axis. So we've got m naught of magnetization now tipped onto the transverse plane, OK? So we had, oh, it's blocking it. All right. How do I? There we go. Is that good? All right, sorry about that. Um, so here's the idea. We have this magnetization here. You won't be able to see this on the video. So, um, and then it goes like this, OK? And then it starts processing around in the xy plane. All right? So that was sort of the process of RF excitation. And then what uh, Professor McVeigh talked about last week is we want to now make spins process at different rates. Okay, and so that's where these gradient coils come into play. And these basically cause spins to, so the precession is typically uh, in the clockwise rotation, so the precession. And all we can do is we can control the speed of precession. So we can make certain spins precess faster than other spins. Right? And that's what we're going to spend most of the, uh, almost all of this lecture today, I guess, just talking about just by having the ability to um, control the frequency of precession. That's how MRI works, and that's how we get our images. All right. So that's, that part is called encoding by sort of implementing these different phaser patterns onto the object. And the cool thing about MRI is you're actually manipulating the object itself. Okay. So when you're in a scanner, we are manipulating your spins. All right. And then every, at every time, so we manipulate the spins into one pattern. And then we measure the summation of all the spins. And that summation is done also with an RF coil. It could be the same RF coil as we use for transmit, or it could be a different RF coil. We'll talk about that when we talk about RF. But the idea is that part is the integration part, okay, where we just sum up all the contribution of all the spins. So we're going to review that a little bit today, have you guys do an exercise, and then go further on into uh, case space and pulse sequences. All right. Any questions up to now? OK. So this is the recipe that Professor McVeigh went over. So we start off with just the basic math, which is this is the definition of a Fourier transform. Okay, And so this is our object, g of xy. And what this formula is saying is you need to take your object 
and you need to multiply it by this complex phasor, and then you need to integrate the whole thing. Okay? And if you do that, for each phasor pattern, that will give you the value of your Fourier transform at one kx, ky location. So here's the idea. So for each k space location, for each kx, ky, you have to create this pattern. Okay? And that's what the gradients do. They create that pattern. Okay? Next, you need to multiply the object by the phasor pattern to get this product. The object times that phasor pattern. Okay? Now, uh, we don't actually do that multiply. There's no, multiply. There's no multiplier in the body. Okay? So it's actually just the fact that, uh, and we'll talk about this, that the multiplication is sort of implicit. It basically, uh, whatever magnetization is there, uh, if it's there, um, like if you have magnetization here like of one, let's say, that's like one times the phasor pattern. And if you have nothing, that's like zero times that phasor pattern. So it's just sort of the, the, the multiplication is done just by what's there and how strong it is. And we'll talk about that a little more. The last step is you do that integration over all space. And so this is done with the RF coil. Okay, And this was done, this is done with the gradients. Uh, later on, if we have time, we'll, we'll also talk about how the integration, typically integration is done where the spins are, but there are really cool methods where you actually move the spins somewhere else and integrate them somewhere else. Uh, and that's pretty cool, but we might be able to talk about that when we talk about sort of uh, more advanced uh, methods. Okay, so any questions about the recipe? All right. So let's sort of go through uh, just sort of what we mean, sort of enhance a little bit what we mean by multiplication and integration, okay? So imagine this is just an object here, okay? And it's got uniform density, okay? So everywhere, so let's say the proton density has some value of one everywhere, okay? So that's a uniform object, right? So now I can imagine um, if I had at kx equals zero, let's say ky equals zero, I would have all the spins aligned, right? Okay, so that would just go on forever. So at the center of K space, all the spins are aligned. All right? And since it's one everywhere, you just have spins of magnitude one everywhere. And then when I sum that up, I should get a really big value, right? Because all the spins are pointing in the same direction. Okay? So that's essentially um, telling me that uh, at that location, it's saying that, so that therefore, if I had G of zero comma zero, let's say this was my object g of x, y, g of zero, zero would be some big number. Okay, because all the spins are aligned, so when I add them up, they're going to give me a very big value. Now let's say I move to some other place in k-space. So if we look at this pattern here, what is the predominant spatial pattern of the spins now? Is it vertical, horizontal? It's diagonal, right? So you can sort of see that these, these spins are all going in the same direction as these spins, right? Okay? So that's got a diagonal variation now of the spin phases across my object. And so if you think about adding up all these vectors, so think about vector summation, um, you know, this spin here is going to cancel out, you know, this spin here when I do the vector addition, right? Uh, or not, yeah, no, sorry, it's going to cancel out something pointing in the opposite direction. So it's going to cancel out something like this guy, right? So those two guys are pointing in opposite directions. So there's going to be a lot of cancellation at this value. So when I do the summation, I expect to get this very small vector sum, okay? So for example, this is g at some value kx, ky, and this is going to be a small number, okay? And that makes sense because my object is uniform, so it's not really a good match for a diagonal. Okay? So that's sort of, if I have a uniform object, what the process looks like. Now let's assume, um, and what I should have done here is I should have left this blank, but let's, let's assume I'm going to just make a really small version of the object. So let's say the object was, uh, now it's just got spins here, spins here, and some spins here. 
So it's zero here, zero here, zero here, and it's one here, it's one here, and it's one here. Okay? It's like you had a uniform object and you just chopped out parts of the object. All right? So where you've chopped out the object, there's no spins left. Right? So now when we apply the phasor pattern to this object, we're going to get something like this. Right? Because basically where there's no spins, the multiplication is implicit. There's, there's no, no spins for us to, to do anything. So it's zero times the phasor pattern is just zero. Okay? And then where I had spins, and I assumed it was one, then it's just the phasor pattern. Okay? So that's where the, the object, by, by imposing a spin pattern onto my object, I'm actually doing that multiplication implicitly. All right? And now we look at this object. This object is a fairly good match. Remember this phasor pattern is this, right? Okay? And so now this phasor pattern is actually a pretty good match for my object. So now when I sum up all these spins, you know, this spin here, the guy who could have canceled them out is gone now. Okay? So I'm going to add up, so this value now, g of kx, ky, is now going to be a big number again. Okay? Because my object is a good match for my spatial pattern. And that's all we're doing in MRI. We're basically, for each spatial pattern we impose, we're saying, how well does this match my object? And the way we do that is by adding up the contribution of all the spins after we've done that multiplication. So it can be a little tricky. So one way to think about it is you sort of want to think about what would your phasor pattern be if, if there were spins everywhere, okay? Because just from looking at this, where you've already done the multiplication, you really can't necessarily say what the phasor pattern is, right? So you want to sort of think about what would the phasor pattern be if there are spins everywhere, and then apply that to your object. All right? Any questions on that? Okay. So let's do, um, so this is a, uh, we'll review this uh, demo that Professor McVeigh did last time. So I think this is just, uh, let's see, this is zero. Let's make this no. Magnitude, this has density uh, zero, one, zero, and one. Okay, so that's my object. It's a very simple object. And this is, what you're gonna see here is this is gonna be the phasor pattern. And we're gonna see how it moves. Okay, so right now you can't really see it, but all the arrows are pointing in the same direction. Okay, and then as the movie goes about, you'll be able to see things more. Um, and then so this is now the phasor pattern, oops. This is now the phasor pattern multiplied by my object. And so you can see it's, it's zero out here, right? Because the, when I take my object and multiply it by my phasor pattern, I just get zeros where there's no spins, okay? And then this is the summation of all that stuff. Okay. So here, you know, all these things sum up, and so I get a fairly large value. Okay, because there is, there is something that is sort of, that's the mean value here. Okay, so this is right now at the center of K space. So this is G of 0, comma 0. And it's, you know, it's a medium large number. And remember, the center of K space is just the area of that, of that object. Okay, so let me switch to the PowerPoint just a little bit, so hopefully this will work. Uh, working on it, great. Okay, so this is the um, this is the movie, and what we're going to do is play the movie. That's too fast. So let me do it by hand. So watch what happens as I change the phaser pattern. Okay, so you notice how um, this value here is is changing. And see right here, it's almost gone to zero. So all the spins are canceling out here. And then as I keep moving my phasor pattern along, at some point, it goes, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. Okay? So for example, at the end here, we have this is my phasor pattern. It's not really a good match for my object, right? These don't really match very well. And so therefore, the summation of all this is pretty small. Okay? Let's see where we find a fairly good match. Let's go back here. OK, 
Okay, there's a fairly good match. And you can sort of see here, this pattern of variation is starting to match my object a little better. And so I'm getting a bigger summation. I think it's pretty big there. So the basic idea is anytime you have a fairly good match between your phasor pattern and your object, the Fourier transform should be fairly large. Okay? Okay, so let's do, um, we're going to do a couple of examples, um, and then we're going to have you guys do an exercise, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So let's just do this one. So this is my uh, phasor pattern here, kx equals 0, ky equals 0. This is my object, right? So it's really easy. I just sum up everything here, and then I get 25, okay? Uh, so then, let's say I had my same phasor pattern, and this is my object here. So the way, you know, an easy way to do these problems is just to figure out what you don't need to add up. So everywhere it's zero, I don't have to worry about these spins anymore, right? So I can just go through here and just cross out these spins. Okay? So those spins we're not going to include, right? And then the other thing I have to do is everywhere I have a minus 1 here, so that's a, you probably can't see it, that's a minus 1, this is a plus 1, okay? I have to think about taking that spin and multiplying it by minus 1, okay? So I have to multiply that by minus 1. All these guys get multiplied by minus 1. Uh, and this guy gets multiplied by minus 1, okay? So now let's, now let's go ahead and sum up. So along this diagonal, I'm going to have minus 1. Along this diagonal, I'm going to have plus 3. Along this diagonal, I'm going to have minus 5, plus 3, and then minus 1. Okay? So minus 1, so that's 6 minus 7 equals minus 1. All right, so that's all it is. We're just, these are a really simple example, but just to get it, drive it home what we're doing here. Uh, let's just do one more example. Um, so let's look at this one. So um, first of all, let's figure out what kx and ky is here, okay? So the first question is what's kx and what's ky? All right. So what is the period of variation along um, the x direction? What's, what's the size? How, how far do I have to go before the spin phase returns to normal? Four, right? So the period is four. So I have to go from here to here. So kx is equal to what then? One fourth. Okay. Now there's a question. Is it plus one fourth or minus one fourth? Okay. You have to turn on the. So is it plus one fourth or minus one fourth? It's plus one fourth, right? Because if I go along the x direction, my phasers are going in a counterclockwise rotation. Okay, and remember the phasers are defined as e to the minus j, 2 pi kx, x. So when kx is positive, it goes clockwise. When kx is negative, it goes counterclockwise. So it's kx equals one, uh, minus 1 fourth, right? Sorry. So this is kx equals minus 1 fourth. Okay, what about KY? What's the period in KY? Also 4, right? So it's, it's 1 fourth. Now is it plus or minus? So as I go along here, as I go along in the KY direction here, it's going clockwise, right? So it's plus 1 fourth, okay? Okay, so now let's, let's go ahead and do the multiplication and integration. So First of all, like we said before, we can just get rid of all the spins that are zero. So we don't have to worry about these spins, these spins, um, let's see, these spins, or these spins, right? So the only spins left are the ones that um, are not crossed out. Everyone see that? Okay. So now let's draw, now let's do the multiply. So everywhere I have minus one, I need to multiply the spin. So basically this gets goes this way. All these spins are going to go the other way, right? Minus 1, minus 1. 
Um, and then this spin is also going to go the other way. OK? So now if I look at the long diagonals, this adds up to minus 1. This adds up to minus 3, minus 5, minus 3, minus 1. OK, summing up along those diagonals. And so the, all the summation sums up to uh, minus 13. OK? So that's all we're doing. We're just multiplying and summing, and then just remembering how to do the multiplication. And so that's, that's, that's sort of reassuring, because we get a relatively large magnitude for our value. And you can see that the, um, the, the, sort of the, uh, the phase pattern sort of matches our object now. Okay, I've got these diagonals uh, in my phase pattern, right? These diagonal patterns here that match these diagonal patterns here. Okay. So whenever the, go ahead. You mean let's say this zero is like 0 0.5? Yes. Okay, that's a great question. So let's say this was 0 0.5, right? Okay, so let's look at this spin here. So we said it was, so it's got, a, it's got an orientation like that, right? So when it comes to the addition, it's going to be 0 0.5. This is j, right, times j, the imaginary number. So I didn't give that to you because I didn't want to do complex math right now, but it's sort of, that's a good question. So anything that's pointing along the vertical is plus j or minus j, okay? All right, so any questions before we guys have you do something on your own? Okay. So this is the exercise just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So basically, um, you're going to enter your answers into the poll EV. Uh, I'll, I haven't opened up the poll yet, so just wait for that. Uh, let's do the first part together. So basically, for every so for B, C, D, and E, uh, so you're going to enter the names of the people in your group, excuse me, whoever you're sitting next to. Uh, for each one, you're going to enter in uh, the value of the Fourier transform and also the, um, what kx and ky you're at, okay? So this is my object here. And then the blue arrows show you what the phasor pattern would be if there were spins everywhere, okay? That's, that's giving you the information about the phasor pattern. So let's just take a look at this first example. So I know at kx, is there any variation in the x direction? So I'm at kx equals zero. What about ky? Any variation in the y direction? Okay, so my ky equals zero. So that's pretty easy. Now, what's the vector sum here? If I take this object and multiply by that phasor <coughs> pattern, what do I? What's my summation? Five, right? So let's say the g at zero zero is equal to five. Okay, because I can ignore these guys, right? And I just sum up the rest. Okay, so it's fairly. So all you need to do is for B, C, D, and E, just go ahead and um, uh, enter in uh, the value of the Fourier transform, so whatever the sum is, and then where in kx and ky you, are, you think you're at. All right, so go ahead and just go ahead. Question? Yeah. Yeah. So from the last year lecture, um, you said a kx value for that this one one was 0.5. Sorry, um, um, last year's lecture or? Yeah, like a year ago. Sorry, watching YouTube. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> so how can you tell if it's a positive or negative from that? Oh, uh, you mean in terms of the kx and ky? Okay, that's a great question. So let's go over that. Let me find some place where I have some room to draw. Um, we'll just do it here, okay? So remember, if I have e to the minus j, 2 pi, kx, x, that's of the form e to the j theta, right? So theta is just equal to minus 2 pi, kx, x, right? <coughs> okay, so that means if x is increasing, so if x is, so if I'm going along x, okay, and kx is positive, then theta becomes more and more negative with increasing x. So that means spins going like this, right? This theta, um, let's draw that a little better. So let's say this is increasing in x, okay? So I'm gonna draw the spins underneath it. So let's say I, this is theta equals zero, right? 
as I go in the x direction, theta being more negative is like that, right? Right, because this is 0, this is minus 45, minus 90. <coughs> okay? The question was like, how do you know the phases from the bottom one, and how do you know if it's going clockwise or counterclockwise? Oh, you mean this one? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's a really good question. You don't. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Basically, because of how I sampled it, there's some ambiguity. And that gets into something called, um, well, that's just the fundamental resolution because of how I've spaced the phasers. If I had information in between, then you would be able to tell. Yeah. Okay. So you can't really tell on the phasers. Yeah, on this one, plus or minus, either one would be fine. Yes. Okay. So basically, the question is, how can you tell going from this guy to this guy? Is it going counterclockwise or clockwise? The answer is you can't. Okay. So. All right. So let me. Um, are there any questions on what you're supposed to do with this? If not, let me open up the poll, and you guys can go at it. So feel free to talk to your neighbors. Uh, you know, enter your answers as a group. Um, Yeah, so, so when you enter the things, don't just answer. You have to like enter it in like all in one line with like the names and your answers, right? So if I just get like B equals 3, then I don't really know what that is. Okay, so just once you've got it all, just enter in all your answers as one line. So the names of the people in your group and all your answers, okay?
Okay, about one more minute. Okay, let's uh, regroup and take a look at this. Um, so um, let's look at B first. So I think a lot of people got it, but there was some diversity in answers. So let's look at the summation first. So um, let's just call the sum S. And um, so we have these guys don't matter. And then we have 4 pointing in the negative direction, so that's minus 4. And then 1 pointing plus 1, so that's just going to be minus 3, right? So that's the vector sum. Okay. Now let's look at kx and ky. Okay. So what's the period of variation along the x direction? 2, right? And we can't really tell whether it's positive or negative, but let's just say it's positive. So we'll say plus 1 half. Okay. What about the variation in the y direction? Is there any variation in the y direction? No. Along any column, there's no variation. So you say ky equals 0. All right. Any questions on that? OK. Let's look at s, uh, c, number c. So s here uh, is also minus 3, right? And what about kx now? Is there any variation in the x direction? No. So kx is equal to 0. What about ky? What's the period? in ky? 2. So it's going to be ky is a half, and once again we can't tell whether it's positive or negative, so we'll just say it's plus half for now. All right? What about d? Um, what's the summation in d? It's 5, right? Everything just adds up, so that's nice. kx, what's the period now? kx is 1 half, right? What about ky? Also 1 half, right? And so now we've got variation in both x and y, which sort of matches our object, right, which has variation in both x and y. And so therefore, we expect to have a much bigger value for the signal, OK? What about e? Uh, what is the summation here? So this cancels this out, and this cancels that out, right? So we're just left with 1. Right? OK. And um, where are we in kx? What's the period now? Before, right? So we're at 1 quarter. Now is it plus or minus 1 quarter? It's 
plus, right? Because we're going clockwise in the x direction. Okay. But what about ky? What is the variation in, in the y direction? Zero. Okay. So this is sort of a simplified version. There'll be a problem on the homework that'll be posted today, which is more of a mix and match. Like you'll be given patterns and things, and you'll have to figure things. But if you apply the logic that you do for this problem, you should be able to do the homework problem. All right. So before we move on, are there any questions on this this exercise? Okay. So now we're going to talk about MRI gradients. Uh, this is to recap. Um, so we have the Z gradient. We've got an X gradient and a Y gradient. And these are all creating linear variations in the BZ, the Z component of the um, magnetic field. Uh, these are, this is what an example of a body coil gradient looks like on, a, I think, a Siemens machine. So these are huge, lots of wires, OK? And also lots of power going through these things. So this is a typical gradient. Um, and this is powered by a one megawatt amplifier. So each channel has this huge amplifier to it. So as a point of reference, the Metallica 2017 World Tour, the number of total watts for the audio to like beam sound into a stadium was only 367,000 watts. Okay. So these are huge amplifiers. Okay. And if you look at the cables on these, they're like this thick. Okay. So don't mess with these. They're of a lot of power. <laughs> okay. So let's we're going to take us uh, some time. We're going to basically work through some of the um, the mathematical notation um, and then get back to sort of how we apply it with pulse sequences. So the first thing is we want to just make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of what we mean by the gradient. So the gradient is simply the gx gradient is simply the partial derivative of the bz component in the x direction. Okay. Same thing for the gy gradient. It's this uh, partial component of the BZ component. So the BZ component is the field pointing in the Z direction and how it varies with Y. So this is the Z direction and you can sort of see if this is the Y direction that component is varying. It's getting stronger as I move along the Y direction. Same thing I can have a GZ component with this DBZ, a DZ, so this is getting stronger as I move in the Z direction. Okay, so that's all the gradients are. Uh, so we can write it Every, at every location, we can write the field as some main field plus these additive gradient fields. And that's the whole key to MR is that by controlling these gradient fields, we can move around in Fourier space. Okay. So for notation, since we don't want to have to rewrite all the GX, GY, GZ every time, we're going to define a vector, a gradient vector G, which has components GX, GY, and GZ. And then we have a position vector x, y, z. And so that whole g, x, x, g, y, y can just be written as the dot product of g and r. All right? So now we can just say the field at every location r is given by, and then here, sort of as a preview, we're going to vary the gradients with time. So we're going to allow things to vary with time as well. So now I have this main field, static field. So this is the static field. And this is, these are the gradients. Okay. So I have a main field, and I'm adding on my gradient field. Okay, and I and the amount that I add on is due to the gradient, and where depends on where I am in time, and also where I am in space. All right. So this is a review of a lecture of, of a slide that Dr. McVeigh showed last time. Just reminding you that we are mostly going to think about the transverse component uh, when we're talking about imaging, so that we're going to define a magnetization, a transverse magnetization vector, which is just mx plus jmy. Okay? So this is just this vector here, and we can imagine it rotating around with some angle of theta. All right? And all we said is that when you have a magnetization in the presence of a magnetic field, it processes around the field. Okay? So if the field is B0, the frequency of procession is just omega equals gamma B naught. And what it looks like, the solution to that differential equation is just some initial condition multiplied by this time varying phasor, where this theta is just minus omega naught t. Okay? So it's going to just go clockwise. Right? 
So now we can sort of start putting things together. So now we're saying that actually my omega is not going to be, so back here I use this term omega naught. Okay, so omega naught for like the field, the frequency just due to the static field. All right. Now I want to get a little more, sort of break it up into two components. In general, I'm going to have my omega is gamma times whatever field there is. Okay, and that's an important point to remember in MR. Spins do basically whatever field they feel is how fast they process. Okay, that's just what they do. They don't ask any questions. You give it a stronger field, it'll process faster. You give it a weaker field, it'll process slower. So the key is knowing what is the field at every location at every point in time. So we can break that into a component due to the static field and then due to the gradients. So this one we're going to call omega naught. Okay, so that's sort of our static frequency, our, or um, sometimes we could call it our center frequency. And then on top of that, there's going to be a delta omega term, which is the additive part that we're talking about. Okay, so this is the gradients actually allow you to change the frequency as a function of space. So now, um, what we want to do really is we want to be able to express every magnetization as some initial magnetization times some phasor pattern. Okay, so this is the phasor pattern that we've been talking about. All right, so this was like this is my object, right? And I'm multiplying it by some phasor pattern. So now what we want to do, and so we, we've sort of seen what phasor patterns look like. So now what we want to do is how do we relate, how do we get those phasor patterns? How do we engineer, come up with the engineering solution? So whatever phasor pattern I want, um, I can get it, okay? So the first thing to realize is that so far we've talked about frequency, right? Okay. And so the first thing to realize is that the change in phase is simply my frequency, okay? Um, I'm not sure why that minus sign is there. Let's see, minus, okay, question mark. Um, but essentially, if, so basically, if, if, if my frequency is not changing at all, um, or sort of, if my frequency is constant, right? Okay, so that, that's why, because it's a negative precession. So basically, if I have a constant frequency, then my phase just goes in a constant fashion. I'm just linearly increasing my phase, right? So that's the d phi dt is basically how fast I'm changing the phase, okay? If I increase the frequency, then my d phi dt is going to increase. I'm going to change my phase much more quickly, okay? But since, since we know that, then we can say, well, if I know that, then I, then I can say, well, my phase is then simply my integral of my frequency, okay? Because I have that relationship. So where, if I want to know what phase I'm at, I simply integrate the, the frequencies that I saw. So that's just this expression here. Once again, I have this omega. So there's going to be two terms. There's going to be this part, the omega naught t term. That's the linear part. That's just going sort of slowly in a linear fashion uh, due to the main field. And then I have this incremental phase. Okay. And so this is the part that we sort of will end up ignoring eventually. Okay. So this is the part we ignored when we went to the rotating frame. So if you remember the example we did in class, the, the spin in the center defined was at omega naught. And so in a rotating frame, that's zero. So that had no incremental phase anymore. Okay? And so only the spins away from the isocenter accumulated phase. And that's due to this delta phi term here. Okay? So let's look at that delta phi term. So that delta phi is simply the integral of the delta omega. Okay? But we know what delta omega is. It's just gamma times my gradient dotted with my um, uh, position. Okay? So it's all it's saying is it's just showing you that if I, if I want to know what the phase is, I simply need to know what the gradients did over time. Okay? And that's what we're going to find out. We're going to find out, we're going to go through some math, but then the solution is going to be incredibly simple. Okay? It's just going to be summing up areas. All right? Okay, but first of all, let's go through an example here. So let's assume I have constant gradient. So here I've turned the gradient on here, I keep it on, and then I turn it off here. Okay, so that's a so basically that gradient is constant for this entire experiment. So if I want to go say this is time zero and this is time t one and this is time t two time t three, okay. 
So if I want to know the phase, I simply take this delta omega, and now let's just assume we have a gx gradient. So it's just gx times x, and then the integral, since it's constant, I just have to multiply by the duration, which is t1. Okay, so that's saying that my phase at some point, this angle here, is just minus gamma gx x t1. Okay? So now let's assume I go to t2, and let's assume that t2 is equal to 2 times t1. Right, so this looks like it's about 45 degrees. Okay. So if I wait twice as long, then my integral is just going to be twice as big. Right? So if I integrate from 0 to t2, then that integral is just going to be minus gamma gx x times the time I have it on. Okay? And so that's going to be this. And let's say that's equal to 90 degrees. So minus 90 degrees, minus 45 degrees. Okay? Now this t3, let's say that's equal to 3 times t1. So once again, if I integrate from 0 to t3, that's just going to give me gamma gx x t3. That's, since t3 is 3 times as long, the, the area I've accumulated is 3 times as much. And so now I'm at you know, minus 135 degrees. Okay? So that's with a constant gradient. All right? So things just linearly increase in, in the presence of a constant gradient. And this is assuming I'm in the rotating frame of reference, so I can ignore this super fast uh, omega naught t term. So that's just uh, this is just what I wrote. So you can take a look at that. Uh, the most more interesting case is what happens if I have a gradient, and then I turn it off, and keep it off for some amount of time, and then I turn it back on again. Okay, so this is what you're going to see much more in MR, where we're turning gradients on and off all the time. So the question is, what happens then? Okay, so this is the same as we had before. This area here uh, is the gx times t1. So this is basically, you can sort of see that that's equal to minus gamma gx t1 is my area, right? And there's an x term out here. Okay, so what happens, so I turn off the gradient here. Does, the inner, does anything happen? So now, and I want to see what's my value at this time t2. Has my phase changed at all? No, because basically the gradient's off, so there's nothing to integrate, right? And so the idea is this is how we sort of do memory. Basically, I use the gradient to get, to get my phase at a certain location, okay? Because it's processing a little faster than it should be. But then I turn it off. Now it's processing at the, the center frequency, so it doesn't actually acquire any more phase. Okay? So this is a really important part of MR, which is basically the spins remember what you did to them. Okay? So I, I moved it here, and then when I turn off the gradient, it just remembers that I did that. Okay? And the cool thing is then if I come on and turn the gradient on later, then it starts picking it up again. Okay? So here I turn the gradient on, and I accumulate some more phase. And so at this point here, I'm at minus 90 degrees. Question? Yes, right. For now, there's no relaxation. We're in a perfect world. The spins just last forever. Uh, in a future lecture, we'll talk about what happens when they go away. OK, so that's a great question. So the thing about MR, there's a lot of layers. And so we sort of have to present each layer at a time. But that's the reality is, yeah, no, nothing lasts forever. Okay. Okay, so that's just sort of writing down what we have. And so, um, so what we have here is we have our final signal is our magnetization. Uh, this is the relaxation that we're going to ignore. This is our object. This is going to be some relaxation, which we'll ignore for now. This is due to sort of the static field contribution. Okay, and then this is what we did. Okay, so that's basically accumulating. This is just saying what is my phase at every point in time, and we're just saying that phase is both a function of the gradients and then time, and it's basically the history of the gradients. Okay, so at the end of the day, all we're going to be doing is integrating gradients. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So, um, so that. This, the, the RF coil integrates all over all of uh, space, okay? But for now, we're going to just assume that we're going to just take a little slice of a volume, okay? So instead of all of space, we're going to imagine just taking a little slice, 
of width delta z. Okay. How we do that, we're going to talk about in a future lecture. But that just means we're just going to look at the variation m x y in the x y plane. Okay. So this is called 2D imaging. All right. And that just allows us to rewrite things where we just have our object in the x y plane. We still have this term here, and then this is the thing we really care about. Okay. Uh, this was the part that, uh, in practice, we have to demodulate to get rid of that term. And the way that's done is e to the j omega naught t just equals cosine omega naught t plus j sine. Oops. Yes, question. Um, in MRI, we, we're, we're always going to, um, we're demodulating the signal. Yeah. Basically, the idea is the, the, the signal is, the signal we get out of the MRI, the coil is, is you know, if it's at three Tesla, it's going at 127 megahertz. Okay. But all the information is in a small area around the 127 megahertz. Similar to like on your radio, when you dial into an FM station, right, it's centered around a certain frequency, but the information is in some bandwidth that has to be limited because otherwise it's going to interfere with other stations, okay? So same thing, there's some a certain bandwidth and typically in the kilohertz range, kilohertz to one megahertz range, so it's a very narrow bandwidth of information. So we're going to take that information and move it down to what's called baseband or around zero frequency so we can deal with it more easily, okay? Uh, and the way that's done is we take our signal S of T and we simply multiply it by cosine omega naught T and sine omega naught t. Okay? And so we have to keep sort of the in, in the quadrant sort of the in uh, in phase and quadrature components. So MRI is actually you're always dealing with complex data. Okay? Which is why um, as Professor McVeigh mentioned last week, you can have like negative numbers. Okay? You can have complex numbers. So the data coming out is actually complex. Okay. So anyways, um, this, this is integral here, we're going to write it with, we're going to expand it out now. So we've kept this sort of compact notation, but now we're going to expand it out to gx, x, gy, y. Okay. And then we're going to play a trick. We're going to say, well, this e to the minus j integral of something something, I just want to get it into a term of e to the minus j 2 pi kx x plus kyy, right? Because then it's a Fourier transform. So I just define, I just look at this and say, well, what could I do? If I define kx as this, and ky is this, then these two things are equal. And that's the whole thing. Basically, it's saying that where you are in kx is simply based on the integral of gx, and where you are in ky is simply the integral of gy. Okay? And that's sort of all the problems we're going to deal with are just playing around with where are you in k space by what gradient you applied. So the nice thing is at the end of the day, then the Fourier tran the MR signal is simply the Fourier transform. It's basically my object multiplied by this phasor pattern. And the cool thing is I control where I am in K space with the gradients. OK? Um, so that's the recap. So basically, th the main point is that the, the spins always spin at the, the frequency determined by the local field. And using gradients, we can control that. Okay. Um, so at each point, the signal we get is simply the Fourier transform of my object at some value of kx and ky, and we control that with our gradients. Okay. So the trick of MR is how do we design our gradients so we efficiently cover enough of k-space to form our image? So we'll talk a little bit about how we go through k-space today. And then next Monday, we'll talk about, you know, what are the requirements? How far out in k-space do we need to go? So let's look at our first k-space trajectory. So this is the most simple thing we can do. We turn on a gradient at time 0. We keep it on for this amount of time. And then we turn it off. And we just want to say, where are we in k-space at every point in time? OK? So let me erase that. So. Where we are in k-space, it's really simple. We just have this kx is equal to gamma over 2 pi, okay, times this the area of underneath my gradient. 
Okay? So at time zero here, have I accumulated any area? No, right? So I'm at the center of K space. Okay? So I'm at the center of K space and the spins are all aligned. Okay. Now I accumulate some area here. So I just move out from here to here in K space. Okay? I've just, I'm going along the KX direction. And, um, and then this causes the spins to, this spin's going to process faster, this spin's going to press slower than the center spin. And so I end up with this spatial pattern here. Okay? And so you can see the period of this is, this is like half a period. From here to here is four, right? So half a period is four. So the period of this guy is eight, right? So we'd say that that's kx equal one over eight. Okay? So this is pointing up, this is pointing down, so we'd have to go another four to make it point up again. Okay. Now I just leave the gradient on and I accumulate more area, right? So I go out twice as far out in k-space, so I'm out here. Okay? And if you look at this, now the period here is four, so I'm at kx equals one-fourth. So I've gone from kx equals zero to one-eighth to one-fourth. So I've just moved out in k-space. Okay? Uh, let's talk about the units a little bit. So as we talked about, spatial frequencies have units of 1 over distance, so typically 1 over centimeters. Okay. Uh, gamma over 2 pi has units of hertz over gauss or hertz over tesla. Okay. So let's just take a look at, and then the gradients typically have units of gauss per centimeter or milliteslas per meter. So let's just do a sanity check. Kx of t is equal to gamma over 2 pi, the integral of this thing. So I have hertz over gauss. I have gauss over centimeters, and I have seconds. Okay, so everything cancels out, and I just get one over centimeters. So it's just a sanity check to to, to make sure our equation is correct. Uh, let's take another now. Let's take a look at an example where we actually have numbers, because in our problem, the problems we give you, you're, you're going to have numbers that you have to calculate. So now you're actually given the amplitude of this gradient is one gauss per centimeter. Okay, so that means in one centimeter the change in field is one gauss. So remember the Earth's field is about half a gauss. So it's a really tiny change in the strength of the field. Say in one centimeter, I basically doubled, I've gone um, uh, basically a change of half, the, of twice the Earth's magnetic field strength in one centimeter. So it's a fairly small change in magnetic field. Okay? And yet that's basically, that's sufficient to, to do the imaging that we need to do. Um, so now I'm saying I've turned this on for 0.235 milliseconds, so a very short amount of time. And now I want to know where, I, where am I out in k-space here in, in actual units, okay? So all I have to do is I take my gamma over 2 pi, so typically you'll be given that. So in this case, it's, we're told it's 42.57 hertz per gauss. Our gradient is 1 gauss per centimeter, and we've turned it on for 0.235 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds, okay? So if you do that, then you end up with kx is equal to 1 inverse centimeters. That just means this period here in physical units is 1 centimeter. Okay? So it's done one period in 1 centimeter. So then where things get fun is you can start turning gradients on and off and moving around in k space. So let's take a look at this. This is sort of your first like pulse sequence or the part of what in MR the timing and amplitude of the pulses is called a pulse sequence. And so learning how to read these and understand them is sort of the business of MR engineering. So here we've turned on the GX gradient. Okay? So we're just going to integrate over space, over time, sort of over time. And so we're just moving from here to here. So at this point in time, we're at this location in K space. Okay? And we've only because the GY gradient is off, we only move along this axis here. Now we turn this gradient off, so we're not going to move out any further in KX. Right? All the, everything is along the GY, so now we just accumulate, integrate over this, and we move up in the KY direction. Okay? So at the end of the day, we're at this point in K space. Okay? And this took us from time 0 to time T4. All right? So let's say we were really impatient. We didn't want to wait that amount. How could we get out to that point in k-space faster? Yeah, just have them on at the same time, right? So actually, I don't have that slide. Oh, well. <laughs> so if I had this on, 
uh, whoops. If I turn this on here, then we would just go directly to there. Okay, I probably have that in the later slide, but okay. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you can turn on the gradients. Okay, so let's take a look at our, our case based example. So here, the RF plus we'll talk about later, that's what tips the spins. And so what we're going to do here is we're first going to turn on the GY gradient and then the GX gradient. And we're going to look at, see, for every point in time, what's the phasor pattern? So these are the phasor patterns, and then where are we in K space? Okay? So at time one, everything's aligned. You can't really see that, but they're all pointing in the same direction. Okay? So we're here in K space. Okay? So this corresponds to that. We're at the center of K space. Okay? Then we turn on the GY gradient, right? And we start accumulating phase. And so at some point, at time two, we're here, let's say. So now you sort of see that this is one period here. Um, sort of hard to see. Let's zoom in on that. Okay, so these spins are pointing in this direction, and these spins are starting to point in this direction as well. Okay, so that's the phasor pattern that's there, and so now we've moved out to this location along the ky direction. All right, let's make it yellow. And now let's say we wait to time here, time three. So we have this full gradient accumulated. So we've moved out farther in k-space. So now we're out here in k-space, in ky. And now you sort of see the period is half the period. So it's double the spatial frequency. So if we zoom in on that, you can sort of see that that's that repetition of the spatial pattern. Okay. And then finally, when we, uh, we turn off the GY gradient and we turn on the GX gradient, okay? So now we're going to create, we keep the variation in Y, we keep that, and now we start ad adding variation in the X direction. So the phasor pattern is going to end up looking diagonal, and this is where we are in K space. Over here. All right, so that's how we move out in K space. And so basically, the gradients change these phasor patterns. And for every phasor pattern, we can tell where we are in K space. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip that for now. Oh, this is the example we did. So this is the, the, the faster way to get out in K space. Okay. Question. Um, for imaging in K space, what like the negative AX and R, would they have to do the same thing in terms of the image, or can you get them both at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. So there, um, the answer is yes and no. If you have a real object, if everything is ideal, then actually there is something called Hermitian symmetry, where the positive and negative frequencies are have exhibit a symmetry. But in reality, there's always uh, the the object is not real because there's variations in the magnetic field due to things that you can't control. And so there is some there are some low phase terms, which makes it so that symmetry isn't preserved. So typically, you can do something called partial Fourier, where you acquire all the data on one side and then just a little bit on the other side. And so there are tricks you can play. But you can't ne normally get away with just ignoring all of them. Okay. That's a good, uh, if someone's interested in an interesting project, that would be a good project to do. Which reminds me, I'm going to stop in 10 minutes on the lecture and we'll start the project. Okay. Oh, actually, no, you guys are doing an exercise now. Perfect. Okay. Um, so now that you understand it all, we'll do two exercises. Um, so here's the question. You want to go out in k-space to kx equals 1 inverse centimeters and 2 inverse centimeters. You're given that gamma over 2 pi equals 4,000 hertz per gauss, which is a nice number to deal with. Uh, you turn on the gradient for 1 millisecond. What amplitude do you need to get out to that place in k-space? OK? So I'm going to open up the poll, and then you guys can work on that. And so once again, you know, put your names and then just give me the value of GX and GY um, that you need.
OK, it looks like most people are getting it, but let's just review this. So here's my GX gradient. It's on for one millisecond. So all I need to do is figure out this area. So all I want is gamma over 2 pi times GX times 1 times 10 to the minus 3 equals 1, right? So this is equal to 4,000 times uh, 10 to the minus 3 GX. Uh, so that's GX times. 4 equals 1. So GX is just 1 quarter Gauss per centimeter. Okay? And then since KY is double, then GY just has to be double of that. Right? So just by inspection, we can write GY is equal to 1 half Gauss per centimeter. All right? So that's a good warm up question. Any questions on that? Okay. So if there's no questions, that means you're ready for the next one, which is this one. Okay, so this is from the book, okay, so it's not like I made this up to torture you. Um, so uh, this one has two parts. Basically, this is the GX, you're given the GX and the GY gradients. Can everyone see that? I'll zoom in on that a little bit. Okay, so it's 10 gauss per centimeter, 10 gauss per centimeter, one millisecond, two milliseconds, three milliseconds. Okay, and what you're asked to do is what KX and KY are you at? at four milliseconds. So hint, that's the easy part. And then where are you at here? So where are you at here and where are you here in terms of KX and KY? Okay, so go ahead and take a few minutes to do that. I'm going to I'll open up the poll.
Okay, let's take a look at this. So um, for part A, uh, the question was, where are you at the end of the pulse sequence? And so if we think about integrating these sequences, um, so clearly if I look at this, this is positive, but then this is negative, and the areas cancel out. Okay, so my kx equals zero. All right? This is, actually a, this is actually a pulse sequence we'll come back to quite a lot. It's used a lot for different types of imaging. It turns out, even though it doesn't move you in case space, it actually allows you to image other things. Okay, but for now, it doesn't do anything. At the end, we're just back to where we started from. Okay, in terms of case space. Uh, similarly, this guy, if I integrate here, it's positive, and then it's balanced out by this negative, and so I'm at ky equals zero. Okay, everyone okay with that? Okay, so let's look at b. So b is now just integrating. Um, this part here, okay? So for example, for the x1, it's just uh, 4, 4258 times 10 gauss per centimeter times 2 times 10 to the minus 3, okay? And I think that gives you about, um, what is it? So what did I get? 85. 0.16 inverse centimeters, okay? And then, um, so that's kx. And then ky is just going to be um, half of that, right? Because it's half the area. So that's like 42.58. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Uh, now, the problem actually asks you to plot what where you are in k space, so let's do that together. Um, is so everyone okay if I erase this part? Okay, I'm going to erase. It's on the video, so you can always look at it later. Okay, so let's look at K, uh, where we are in terms of time in Kx. Okay, so basically this is 1, 2, 3, 4. So we know at Four, we're back at zero, and we start off at zero. And at two, we were at uh, whatever that was, 85.16. Okay? And then, since it's constant, it's just going to be linearly increase. Okay? So it's just going to go up and down. Right? Now let's look at ky. So once again, one, two, three, four. Beginning is zero, end is zero. In the middle, it's going to be uh, 42.58, right? Um, but let's think. We're integrating uh, a line here, right? So it's going to be parabolic up like that, right? So it's going to be a parabola to here. And then it's going to turn over like this, right? because it's increasing less fast. As this decreases, the increase is less. And then here, it's going to just reverse itself. Okay, so that would be what where we are in Ky. Okay, now typically what we want to know is the combination Kx and Ky. Okay, so we'll do a parametric, so now we have to think about things parametrically. Okay, so we start off at zero, zero, and we end up at zero, zero. Okay, 
So that's fine. And where are we going out to? We're going out to, this is 85, this is 42. So we're going out to here, okay? And so the question is, how do we get out to there? Okay, so we look at this. So this is saying that initially we move out slowly and then we start getting faster along the ky direction, right? So probably, in, and we're gonna sort of, it's gonna follow a trajectory like this, right? So that's going out and then coming back, it's just gonna reverse and so it's just gonna reverse and come back. Okay, so that's all we're doing. We're just moving out and then coming back. All right. So any questions about that? Okay. So that's an introduction to moving around k-space. On Monday, we'll talk about the spin warp pulse sequence and talk about sampling. And at the end of that lecture, you should have a good idea of how people actually design a basic MRI pulse sequence. All right. So are there any questions? Okay. So just some announcements before we go over the final project. So um, homework six, I guess, will be posted tonight, uh, and it's due Monday. Um, morning. And then um, actually the quiz ones are graded now. Um, so let me go over, I guess I'll do that now. So, um, so uh, you can pick them up after class and then the solutions will be posted online. If you have questions about the grading, I guess those will go, is Sean here? Okay, there you are, <laughs> okay. Solutions are online. So take a look at the solutions, and if you have questions, uh, you can ask us. Okay. Um, this is the histogram. So this is in percentage. So there was 97 points. This is normalized to 100%. The, no one got 105%. It's just the, the histogram is sort of so. But uh, the average was about 80%, right? Okay. So that's how it turned out. So that's actually um, a nice distribution. Okay. So if you have questions about the quiz one, please feel free to uh, talk to any of us. Okay, if there's no more questions on that, let me just go over the final project very quickly. I know we're sort of out of time, but let's just, this is posted online on TED. Uh, the main things that we'll talk, I want to just talk about is the final project is on uh, December 11th during the final exam period. So it is during final exam week. It's three hours. The good thing is out of those three hours, you really only have to be active for like 12 minutes plus asking questions for the other stuff. So I think it's a pretty good deal, but um, you'll have to do the work beforehand, obviously. Okay. Um, now, since it is always a tight schedule, if someone, if a couple groups would like to go early, uh, the last day of class is available if you really want to just get it out of the way. Um, we could probably have time for two groups maybe. We'll have quiz two then, but we can, if we have groups presenting, we can make it a slightly shorter quiz. Um, so let us know by next Wednesday if you're interested in that. Uh, there will be, um, right now it looks like three members per group. Um, so that's uh, assuming 45 students. Now if there are changes in enrollment, that may or may not change. but for now, assume you're looking for a group of three. If you absolutely, uh, um, if, if we need to, we might have a group of four, but uh, essentially we're gonna look for groups of three first, okay? So assume you'll have a group of three. Uh, you should, you'll be giving a 12 minute presentation. Um, so I think this is actually nine minutes with three minutes, yeah. So it's like 12 minutes total. So it's actually gonna be quite short. Um, the only things you need to worry about for now is we do want to make everything sort of in terms of the project and the partners finalized by 10 a.m. next Wednesday. So make sure you submit the information to both Professor McVeigh and myself. We just want to make sure everyone has a group and if there are groups that still need to be formed, at least we can talk about it in class next Wednesday. Okay. Uh, there are three options. Options two and three are for those of you who want something a little more uh, prescribed. And for each option, each option is limited to the first two groups that send an email to us saying that they want to do that option. So option one, option two is like reviewing MR in like nine minutes. And option three is reviewing CT in like nine minutes. Okay. So it's more like making a YouTube video sort of type thing. Um, 
So that's, and uh, I did this one year where I had all the groups do this, and it was a really long three hours. So, <laughs> so after that, like after the 10th presentation on MRI, you're just like, whatever. Um, so in this case, we limit it to like two per, per modality, uh, which means most of you will be doing option one, which means do whatever you will like. The main thing is that it has to be um, related to sort of, you have to use the, the concepts from the course. We give some suggestions here. Um, so for example, if you go back to like the last pages, here are some topics on CT, here are some topics on MRI. Uh, you don't have to be limited to those. You can have an idea, if you have something you're really interested in, just talk to us. The main thing for option one is we do ask you by Wednesday to send us like a few sentences describing what you're gonna do. Uh, typically, we recommend maybe you have a paper and you review the paper and describe what's in the paper. We want to make sure that what you're doing is not too hard, but not too easy, okay? So unfortunately, if you pick something too hard, it's going to be really hard for you to do the project. So we're just here to sort of guide you and make sure the project you do is feasible and yet will sort of satisfy the requirements. All right? Any questions? So feel free to read through this. If you have questions, you can certainly ask during class and also send email um, and we'll send out clarifying comments as needed. Question in the back. Can you say that again? You want there might be a there might be an opportunity for a free solo, um, but let's let's go ahead and see how that looks. Okay, so for now, let's try to. Basically, it's a time constraint. We have three hours. We have X number of groups. So if some groups decide to go early, then we have a little more options. So um, like, if you want to be one of the people to go early and do something like that, just let us know. OK? Any other questions? OK, great. So uh, I have office hours here. So if you have questions, you can ask me.